All right, well, let's jump right in here today. If you've been around, you know we've been in a series of messages <clears throat> that I'm declaring uh, as four key areas to every human being being fulfilled. These are like the essentials to why we're here, what God had in mind when he created us. And if we don't engage in these four areas, then there will be a place in our life that's just empty, really. If we're honest with ourselves, we'll find ourselves unfulfilled, unsatisfied, and you know, groping around trying to fill the spot with other things, which is what happens all the time. So of these four things, um, you know, if, again, if you've been here, you know I tend to do recaps and kind of try to keep everybody up to speed because there's new people in the house. I'm not going to take a lot of time with that today. I would encourage you, if you want, you can go online and you can start from the beginning and you can listen to these things. You can get the church's app, which is a great way of, they're doing an amazing job with that, by the way. Thank you for our media team back there. Love you guys. You're doing amazing. But they keep that stuff fresh and current and looking good and and uh, so on. So, uh, But for today, let me just kind of hit the list. These are the four things we're talking about. To know, to flow, to go, and to grow. Now, if you're here for the first time, that might seem really kind of out there. You don't know what any of that means. Let me just give you the first couple ideas here. At the end of the day, the primary reason each one of us were created was to know God. We were created by him, for him. So you and I were wired with certain appetites, and at its central you know, heart level, that ultimately was to know God. We can say it this way. If you don't have a relationship with him, not just a knowledge about him, but to know him, to talk to him, and to allow him to speak to you, there's going to be a place in your life that's forever empty, and it's the primary place of your life. It's the main reason we were all created was, was to know God. And we've said this, I won't take a lot of time again here, but there are levels of knowing. Just like there's levels of knowing people, you can know them at a very shallow level, very kind of surface level, or you can know them in a deep and meaningful way. And the reason relationships have different levels is because deep, meaningful relationships cost something. That's a simple truth. They, they just cost something. Even Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross, that's the cost, and follow me. If you want to know me in a deep and meaningful way. Jesus also said there will be a whole group of people, unfortunately, that he'll have to turn to who will say to him, Lord, we've done all these wonderful things in your name. Like these are Christian activities. And Jesus' response to them will be, depart from me. I never knew you. That's a sober verse of Scripture, that you can actually do the right things but not have the relationship piece worked out. And that's the issue, the big issue for God, and it should be the big issue for us. So knowing God, if you don't know him, you're going to be really empty inside. He wants to know you. That's why Jesus died, so our sin issue could be removed, so we could come into a loving relationship without condemnation. Are you still with me? Come on. He also, uh, it's important for us to acknowledge that knowing is about knowing each other. So God, there will be a part of us that's empty and missing if we don't have meaningful relationships with one another. And the reason some relationships are meaningful and some are not is because meaningful relationships cost something. <laughs> Come on. You're just going to have to pay the price of your pride at times and making commitments to each other. That's the cost of meaningful relationships. But, oh, the rewards are so worth it. So <clears throat> knowing. And then we talked about flowing. Now you say, what the heck is flowing? <laughs> flowing. Jesus said that the person who believes on him out of his heart will flow. A river, and yeah, it's the name of this local church, but it ain't about this church. This was happening way before we were here. Out of his heart will flow a river of living water. This spake Jesus of the Holy Spirit. And so we've said this, that if your whole life is all about stuff coming to you and nothing is flowing through you to others, there'll be a part of you that's just empty. You can either believe that or prove that, but you were created to have something flowing through you. 
Come on, say amen, because it's the truth. And if you're not, you're still, can, you're still loved. You can still go to heaven. But we're just talking about there's going to be an area of your life deeply unsatisfied because you were created by God for this flow thing to occur. We also talked about how we flow together. So what's flowing out of you and what's flowing out of me ought to complement one another so the world can see what it looks like to know God and to have relationships that God has blessed, what that looks like. So and then last week, if you were here, we touched on the whole going piece, the great uh, commission in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, go into the, all the world with this good news. And though, again, you can go to heaven, you can have a lot of good things going on in your life, there is something that God is um, interested in that we take some risk and we get out of and we actually re resist, if you will, the tendency to build comfortable environments that we just sit down in. He's saying, you were born for something greater than just a few little comfortable things propping up your temporary existence on this world. I've included you in something eternal, and I want you to come with me or go outside of your comfort zone and come with me, the Lord would say, and be a part of what I'm doing in the world today. You were actually born for greatness. And greatness isn't defined by us carving out these little comfortable spaces. It's about partnership with God, right? The whole going piece. So today, <clears throat> I'm actually going to stay in this whole theme of this, this series because ultimately we're going to be going from go to grow. Um, but I was just in prayer and I was prepping for this. And in the context of it all, I was pondering what's going on in the land of Israel right now. Most all of us are mindful that Israel was attacked uh, on October the 7th. And it is a very, very significant season in the world's history. If you don't know that, you need to know that because throughout history, God has used Israel as an, a, a time uh, indicator for his prophetic plan throughout the world. I'm not going to go into all of that right now, but you need to understand there's always a significant uh, concern that should be had when things are happening in Israel. And so I was just pondering all of these things, and I was reminded of a few weeks back when I was doing this series on the word flow. And I was ministering out of John's gospel, uh, John chapter 7, and where Jesus stands up on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and he makes this tremendous invitation for people to come to him. And uh, it was what's called the last day of the feast, the great day of the feast. Now, it is no coincidence that Israel was just attacked on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles in the actual Jewish calendar and so on. And so I want to talk to that a little bit. But I wanted to play the clip from a couple weeks back. This is before the attack occurred because as I was speaking that day, I had this deep sense that something was happening, although I couldn't have told you then I didn't know Israel was going to be attacked. All I knew, and it's what I made mention of in this little clip we're going to play because I want to use it as a launching pad for where we're going today. So if we could go ahead and run that clip, I'd appreciate it. You know, Jesus died on the Passover, literally was crucified during the Feast of Passover, which is an absolute fulfillment of what that feast was about, the killing of the lamb, the blood being applied so that the death angel, death angel would have to pass over. Jesus literally fulfilled it. Next major feast, day of Pentecost, on the actual day of Pentecost, when they were all gathered together in one place, the Holy Spirit was poured out, literally fulfilling the feast. But there's one feast that's not yet been fulfilled in the historical calendar, and it is this Feast of Tabernacles. It's the final in gathering, and many believe, and I think rightly so, that in the actual time frame uh, of the feast that something significant will happen. I just, I'm of that persuasion, although God can do it however he wants. He doesn't have to please my you know, interpretation of anything. But I, it makes a lot of sense that God would stay consistent to his pattern. And that being said, this topic we're on right now is significant because the timing of Jesus saying it, though it was on the day during his life, natural lifespan, 
it's also a prophetic uh, mark being made to say that in this last generation when this feast will be fulfilled there will be a people out of whose heart is flowing water to the whole world for the glory of God it's going to be it's not just the day of Pentecost way back then it's a now thing but it's an end of the age fulfillment of something an end of the age fulfillment I'm so grateful for our Jewish roots and the history that we have through Israel. Okay. So if you're not familiar with any of these things, let me just say it very succinctly here. In the nation of Israel, God had three major feasts that all the males were commanded to every year come to Jerusalem to observe these feasts. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, three feasts in the nation of Israel. And every year, all the males were to come up to celebrate these feasts. For them, they were feasts of remembrance. They were ways of celebrating all that God had done for them. But from God's perspective, these feasts were pointing towards something that would ultimately be fulfilled spiritually and for eternity. So, for instance, you know this, but for Passover, what happened? The Feast of Passover was created because they came out of Egypt. If you've seen Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, you know all about these things, okay? And the lamb was killed. They were commanded to kill a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and then the angel of death would pass over them, and then they escaped from Egypt, right? Well, that, and then they were commanded to celebrate this Feast of Passover. That was an observation. Every year they were supposed to do this. Well, little did they know that they weren't just remembering what God had done for them, that all of that was serving as a picture of what was about to happen and be fulfilled in the person of Jesus when he would hang on a cross. That's why John the Baptist says, behold, talking about Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was the fulfillment of of what the Passover lamb was when they came out of Egypt, all of that served as a way for God to help us get our head around what was happening so that we would embrace the need to have Jesus' blood, like they did on the doorpost of their house in Egypt, that we would embrace the need to take the blood of Jesus on the cross and apply it to our own lives so that I can pass, come on, from death to life. Without the blood of Jesus in your life and you embracing that and being a steward of that, you don't have that benefit according to the scripture, right? So that was Passover. Jesus, I know you're, you know these things, but oh, how good it is to hear them. Jesus physically died on the actual calendar day. Time, thank you. The time of day and everything according to the feast of Passover in Jewish calendar actually died hung on the cross on that actual day okay that's a, it's not a coincidence here feast second feast of israel pentecost on the actual day of pentecost if you want to check these things out they're in your bible you should know these things acts chapter 2 on the day the actual day of pentecost the feast was fulfilled because the holy spirit was poured out on the church that she was birthed in power ends out on the street 3000 souls come to know christ that day the actual feast the actual day no longer a celebration feast of the giving of the law now a fulfilled feast because god writes his law on the heart of the person on the day of pentecost all right one last feast has not yet been fulfilled it's being, it's, we've been waiting for it to be fulfilled, and it's the final feast of Israel, the Feast of Tabernacles, or often called the Feast of Ingathering. It's the final harvest of the earth, and that feast is on us now. So most believe, as I just said in the little clip, and you're hearing it twice, <laughs> most believe that just like God physically honored the actual day and fulfilled it on the actual day, both for Passover, Pentecost, that the same thing will apply during tabernacles. Like the Lord himself will come back during the actual feast of tabernacles. Many believe that, and I don't know why not to believe that. It makes sense that God would stick to the pattern. So now the question becomes this. Jesus stood up 
On the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, which is what we're going to get to here in just a moment. Amen. And he begins to speak some very, very significant things. As a reminder, an important reminder. So I had this stirring that two weeks ago where this clip was from that it was during the actual Feast of Tabernacles, physically being celebrated in Israel, which is why we had people over there and so on, that something was going on. Couldn't tell. I had no idea Israel was about to be attacked on the eighth day, the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the same day Jesus stands up in John 7 on the eighth day and says some things. Now, I'm saying all of that because I believe God wants us to glean from what Jesus was saying. Before we go there, I want to say this, the number eight, because you just hang with me. It'll make sense. So the Feast of Tabernacles has eight days of celebration. And if you know anything about Scripture, numbers matter in the Bible. They just do. God wove all this thing in numerically. And... Um, so the number eight is the day of new beginnings. Okay, now why do you say that? Well, because there's seven days in a week. And then what happens when Monday hits? It's a new week. It's the eighth day, if you will. It's the day after the seven, and it's a new beginning. It's the day eight. If you also want to take that thought a little further, you can look at Noah and the flood and his family. How many people were saved in the ark? Eight souls were saved. Noah, right, his wife. And then his two sons and their daughters, eight people were saved. And so when the ark was built and they all went into the ark, uh, Peter tells us in the New Testament that this was a picture of the water, like the waters of baptism and whatever, but it's a picture of a brand new beginning. So what happens is, yes, the world was judged by a flood. Charity read it in her scripture verse this morning. It was judged by a flood, but... The, the issue of eight has to do with new beginnings. God uses eight people to replenish the whole earth according to the scripture. Okay? So when we look at Israel right now, and we look at what, what's going on in Israel, and we see this eighth day attack on the eighth day of the tabernacle's feast, they were attacked. Uh, you can easily look at the, the, the trauma and the hardship and the scariness of all of that and get focused on all the evil that's going on. But let me just submit to you, the number eight, in its purest sense, speaks to new beginnings. And I feel like if we're going to be mindful of what the Spirit of God is saying right now, He wants a people who see what He's getting ready to do in the earth. You know, the end of the age, that word scares people, and I understand why. But let's not lose sight of what God's doing here. It's the end of one thing because of the beginning of something else. And we need to keep our hearts and our minds fixed on this kingdom coming. You know, we pray this across Christendom in different denominations. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What do we pray? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? On earth, in earth, as it is in heaven. Right? So, so this is a, a common thing that Jesus told us to pray. Why? Because this is coming kingdom. So though it's a very sober time, it also ought to be a time of great anticipation and expectation. Praise God. That's good, Pastor Rob. Thank you. Doesn't matter. I'm going to preach anyways. <laughs> you know, they say geese fly really far in formation, but they honk and they cheer on. <laughs> the one up front. You know, honk if you love Jesus. That's all I'm, I'm just asking you for some help here today. Honk, honk. Thank you. We'll get somewhere together if you'll honk for me every now and then. You know, it's funny. I was studying yesterday, prepping for this, and I already had this word from John 7 in my heart. And I listen to the Bible annually, I, you know, so many verses a day and so on. And in the particular plan I'm listening to, what comes up on yesterday's, as I'm studying, on yesterday's plan, John 7. Now, you might say, oh, that's just coincidental. You can think whatever. It doesn't matter to me. For me, everywhere I turn, the Holy Spirit 
is speaking and confirming, and we need to be listening or paying attention, at least to give him a chance to give us confidence in what we're doing and where we're going. Uh, whether it matters to you or not, it matters to me. This clip I just played happened to be the eighth clip in the series. Now, you might say that's a coincidental thing to you. You can say whatever. I don't, I don't care. I'm just telling you, everywhere I turn, the Spirit of the Lord is affirming and confirming certain things about where we are and what he wants us to be valuing. You know, you value, we value, we place value on all kinds of things, some of which is properly placed and a lot of things not so properly placed. And if you don't know this, help me, Lord, the scripture says everything that can be shaken will be shaken, both in heaven and on earth. Everything is going to be shaken so that what those things that cannot be shaken will remain. So you, whether you like it, agree with it, it doesn't really matter. It's going to happen according to God. Everything's going to be shaken, and we're going to ultimately find out what was from him and what wasn't from him. And I don't want to be one who has nothing left to look at when it all shakes out. I hope I'm building my life on the stuff that matters. That's the point. Honk, honk. Thank you for that honk. Come on. <laughs> Love it. So I believe this word is, is, though we're going to be talking just for a little bit here concerning living waters, because that's what Jesus spoke about on the eighth day. Um, it's bigger than just this local church. It's bigger than this congregation. I believe this is a word from God to the church, his people throughout the world. And I know that's a pretty lofty thing to say. You don't even have to agree with me. I'm just declaring it in that spirit because I believe it with all of my heart. The context of Jesus' words on that day is in John's Gospel, chapter 7. I wanted to read one verse before we get into the actual meat of the verse. Uh, I'm going to do my best here to expedite where we're going in a meaningful way. But John 7 and 8 says this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, he was like a, a rabbi, if you will, or a teacher for a bunch of uh, students that were following him around. That's who Jesus, how Jesus operated. And here he's speaking to his disciples. And in verse 8, he says to them, you go up to the feast. Now, he's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And then he says, I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now, there's something important here to, to remember. Every Jewish male was commanded every year to attend these three feasts. Jesus was a Jewish male. He was Jewish, and he was a man. And yet, here he is telling his disciples who are being taught by him, I'm not going to this feast. You think about what that must have felt like for them, like confusion was had to be all over that for them. What in the world? Why not? This is, everybody knows this is what we're supposed to do. He says, you go up. And the reason he says, I'm not going, is because my time has not fully come. Now, I'm going to keep this just way simple because this is, we do better with simple. But we're living at a time of what many would call the time of fullness. In the past, things have been in shadows and in types, and there's been levels of, you know, fulfillment of prophecies and things like that. But we're living at the end of the age when the final in gathering, that's when everything comes to maturity and fruition, it's the time of fullness, okay? So here, Jesus is saying, you guys go up to the feast. My time has not fully come yet. And so they're confused, no doubt, like a lot of people today in the world, and they go on to celebrate the feast like Jesus told them. But Jesus was, in essence, saying, I'm getting ready to move past just the rehearsal of a bunch of events that they do every year. I'm getting ready to step into the fulfillment of this thing. This will no longer just be a rehearsal event of what's going to come one day. I'm getting ready to set the stage for what fulfillment will look like. Okay? So let's think, think about it like this. When Jesus finally does show up at the feast, and he does, he's kind of doing it secretly, and he's ministering to people along the way. His disciples don't know about this. But on this final day of the feast, Jesus is there, and he does some amazing things that I believe. Let me give it to you like this. 
are instructions for us who are alive now at the end of the age when God is about to fulfill the feast. I don't believe that it's a coincidence that on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles this year, just a few days ago, the war in Israel broke out. I do not think that's a coincidence. I think it's a way that God's trying to get our attention to where we're living and look at what the eighth day is about. What is the eighth day about according to the scripture? So we're going to see just a little bit of this. If you're like me, I want to know what God wants me to know so I can do what God wants me to do. Here we go. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, that is, by the way, the eighth day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out. Let me just stop right here for a second. You want to know what to expect on the eighth day that we're now living in in the world that God is drawing attention to? We can fully expect Jesus to stand up again in the earth and to cry out a message. We're standing on the edge of one of the greatest revivals the world has ever known. And the preaching of the gospel will be heard like it's never been heard before in this generation. That's what we should expect on this eighth day that God is highlighting for us. He's saying, pay attention, because what happened here with Jesus is, was in his generation, it was a foreshadowing of the day of fulfillment, and people who are alive at that day, like us right now, need to know these things. So Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, capital S, which is the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified, although all that's happened now. You know, little uh, instructional moment here. The Feast of Tabernacles. Seven days it was celebrated. And they had different things during the Feast of Tabernacles that they were supposed to do. Every morning for the first seven days of the feast, every morning, the priest would take a golden picture, like a, a vase. They would go down to the Pool of Siloam, and they would scoop up some water from the Pool of Siloam. They would carry that water all the way back up to the temple and to the altar, and they would pour the water out like a libation or a drink offering, on the eastern side of the altar, they would pour it out. And then on the western side of the altar, I'm sorry, on the western side of the altar, on the eastern side of the altar, they would pour out wine. And there's significance to that, but we're not going there today. And they did this every day of the feast, the first seven days. They'd go get water, they'd bring it up, and they'd pour it out. Okay. But on the eighth day, they didn't do this. There was no water collected, and there was no water poured out on the eighth day of the feast. And so that's the very day. The last day, the eighth day, the same day Israel was just attacked, the eighth day of the feast. That's the day Jesus stands up here in John's gospel. If we can get that back up here, John 7 and 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up. This is the moment where the priests have not gone that morning and grabbed water and put, brought it up and poured it out. There's no water being seen anywhere. Jesus stands up and says, if any man's thirsty... It's like during the seven days, there was like this provision, but there's no longer any provision but the person of Jesus Christ. And so for seven days in this feast, people have had this kind of thing, you know, demonstrated in front of them, and suddenly it dries up. It's no longer there, and the only way to get satisfied is to give your heart to Jesus. You want to know where we're standing in history? This is the eighth day. God's highlighting it, and he's telling us that this is the hour that people have to come to Jesus if they're going to satisfy the thirst that's raging, really, on the inside of every human heart. There is a, you know, people cover it up, put makeup on it, do all kinds of stuff, but there's a raging thirst. People are missing something, and they know it. 
And that something is someone, it's Jesus Christ. Not religion, not religious stuff, the person of Jesus Christ. So, religious shadows and rituals and types will always leave us dry. Here's just a few quick points. What can we glean from Jesus' prophetic ministry on that day that belongs to us at the end of the generation where we stand? We could say simply this, if any man's thirsty, let him come unto me. This is a day for coming to Jesus. You want to know what the eighth day is about? For the world. Many people have been prophesying that there will be bil a billion, billions of people Billion soul harvest, billions of people coming to know Christ in a personal way. Not through somebody else, not through a priest, not through, through the Holy Spirit, personal face-to-face -face communion with God, which is what Jesus died for each of us to have. This is the day of coming to Jesus. People say, oh, this is the day when Russia is going to, you know, mount up and all. It is that day, yes. It's true. The nations are going to circle Israel according to the scripture at some point. And all the world will be gathered together against that land according to the scripture. But this is not a day to focus on all of that so much. It's the day of coming to Jesus for the world. This is also a day of drinking deep of the person of Jesus. Jesus said, if any man's thirsty, which, by the way, there's no other water anywhere else because the seven days poured water and there's no on the eighth day. Let me just, I'm trying to say it the best I know how. Things are drying up. Things are drying up everywhere. Wherever your source has been in the past is not going to be there anymore because there's going to be only one place to drink from, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you don't have to believe me. Go on looking for water in all the wrong places. I'm just telling you, you're going to find this to be the truth of this hour. The only thing that will satisfy is this coming to Jesus and not just coming he said, if any man's thirsty, let him come unto me, not to a church movement, not to a style of worship, not to a particular set of doctrines. Come to the person of Jesus Christ. Have a relationship with this guy. And then drink. I say it a lot. I'll say it some more. You have permission to drink. What do I mean by that? You know, you get saved or you give your heart to Jesus. Yes, you escape hell because he died in payment for your sins and all that stuff. But you come to Jesus not to become a worker first, but to become a lover. Drink of Jesus. Enjoy Jesus. He's the best friend you'll ever have. He'll stick with you and everybody else will leave you. How do I know that? Because I've lived that. I've lived that. I'm not talking out of some textbook. I'm talking out of my life. It's a day for coming to Jesus. It's a day for drinking of the person of Jesus. Here's a great Psalm 63 and 1. Oh God, this is David, a Psalm of David in the wilderness of Judah. It says, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You see the connection to thirst and the person of God. I long for you, God. You're the one who quenches my thirst. And then it says this, to see your power and your glory so as I have seen you in the sanctuary. As if to say, I want to see you out there the way I've experienced you inside the church building during worship. I want to I feel your power so that I can make known your power and your glory to a hurting world. This is also a day, if we're using our primary text here, John 7. I know I'm all over the place, but you guys are so versatile. I can feel it. You're just following me right around the, down the path. Our primary text is John 7, 37 through 39. That's primary text today, and I'm every now and then going off and grabbing supporting scriptures. Are you still with me? <laughs> okay, I should have said that up front. Roll with it. Come on. Honk, honk. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. They have bumper stickers that say that, you know, honk if you love Jesus. That's a good one. I don't think they were thinking about a goose, but anyway. <laughs> They're very old and tired, my wife says. Yeah, she's my, my greatest critic and my greatest fan. She is. She's just my greatest. Oh. <laughs> 
I love you. Where was I? <laughs> I was just kind of caught up at the moment. You know, I get looking at my wife. I'm like, wow, man. What are y'all doing here? <laughs> y'all can go home. <laughs> I mean, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the eighth day. The, yeah. Yeah. Amen. On the eighth day, the Jewish nation is, is gets to see the Torah scrolls brought out and gets to touch them vicariously. Yeah, they celebrate the person. It's amazing. It's awesome. This is the day, according to John 7, 38. Can we get that one up there? Whoever believes in me. We're just trying to glean some basic instruction from Jesus on the eighth day of what those who are alive at the fulfillment of the eighth day are going to need to know. And here's something we need to know, that this is an hour, this eighth day hour, to believe on him. Now, what does this word believe mean? It's really... If you study the word out, it simply has to do with placing your faith or your trust in him, trusting the Lord. And let me tell you, right now, the world, and it's only going to grow, I hate to say this, is going to experience greater levels of anxiety and fear and stress. Now, this is not my opinion. These are Jesus' words. Jesus says at the end of the age, men's hearts will fail them because of fear of the things coming upon the earth. That's what Jesus said. Now, why does this matter? Because what Jesus is saying to those who have a relationship with him, if any man's thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes in me, he that trusts me, he that, as he's drinking and getting to know me, realizes I can be trusted. I've got this. I can handle the weight of your life. I can carry you and the things that concern you through anything if you'll trust me. And I need you to trust me. So if there's one thing we should be mindful of for our own lives, but also for people around us, is that fear, stress, and anxiety are on the rise. And the world's remedy is often medication. And I'm not here to condemn people who take medicines to manage some of these things. But let me just say to you, it'll never really fix what's going on. Because the only real fix for fear, stress, and anxiety is an active trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And there has to be a cultivation of that relationship so you realize, I really can trust this guy. I mean, he really can carry my cares and my fears and my things. And let me just say to you, if we don't get this part down, what will happen is we'll start operating out of fear, stress, and anxiety, which makes us make bad decisions. Decisions based on fear, stress, and anxiety are bad decisions because your, your, your body kicks into a whole different uh, function during fight and flight syndrome where you move into it like you're trying to protect for the immediate danger that's on you, but you have no real view of future things. And you start making, and when you live in fear, stress, and anxiety, you start making decisions that do not have the future's best interest in mind. It's all very momentary stuff, and it'll mess up the decision-making process we're in. So we've got to be a people, come on, that are let God free us from fears by learning to trust. And there's a process. We all have them, and he's helping us with this. Here's a good verse, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Here's what it says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now listen to this verse. You should put this one to memory. Casting all your anxieties or your cares on him because he cares for you. Now, let me just highlight this because it matters. These two verses are side by side for a reason. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and then cast all your cares over to him because he cares for you. As if to say, if you don't cast your cares, it's an act of your pride. Now, let me restate that so you'll get it if you hadn't get, caught this. Every time I hold on to all of my worries, I'm saying, in essence, I've got this. Or I'm the one who's going to somehow carry and fix. And I'm the one, through my own wisdom or my own strategies, I'm going to 
secure my future. And, and God is saying, that's pride. Because the reality is, I hate to break you, the news to you, you're not smart enough. You're just not. You're smart, but you're not smart enough. We need him. And so here he says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then he says, cast all your cares, as if to say, God, I've been trusting in me so long, and all that's doing is fueling fear, stress, and anxiety. Because everywhere I turn, I'm aware that there's a vulnerable spot in my life, and I, I might not be able to fix that, and I can't see how to get that done. And, and, and we got all these things constantly poking at us. They're spiritual in nature, by the way. And, and they're keeping us in fear, stress, and anxiety. And here, the remedy, it's a simple remedy. Come on, it's an eighth-day thing because the last day, fear will cover the earth for those who don't know him. Come on. If any man's thirsty, let him come unto me. Let him drink. And then he that believes, he that trusts, he that has learned to put the weight of his life and his future unto Jesus, that person, right, is going to have something begin happening through them that only God could do, and it's a powerful, powerful thing. So we have to humble ourselves. And don't say you can't do that because you can. Your heart was created to humble like your lungs were created to breathe. You just buy the truth, and you say, God, I've, I've been carrying it all on my own, and I'm choosing today. That's pride. That's me thinking I can handle me. But the truth is, it's creating stress and fear and anxiety. I cast my cares and anxieties over to you. And here's why. Because I believe you care for me. Oh, what a beautiful promise. What a beautiful promise. Our primary text, John 7, 37, 38, 39. He that believes on me, it's a time to believe. As the scripture has said, I have to highlight this because it matters a ton here. You want to know where we're living? We're living at a time where we need to get back to the word of God. What does the scripture say about it? We've got all kinds of commentators and newscasters and people voicing their opinions and pontificating about this and that. And there's come on. This is what this eighth day is about. People coming back to the word of God. Here's what the scripture says about it. Why does that matter? Because you're going to be, and I will be tossed about with every wind of whatever's coming down the pike. And never before has a generation been so inundated with information. We are living in the information age. Your phone, everywhere you turn, there's constantly people vying for your amen. They want you to say, yes, I agree with that. The only real, reliable, historically reliable book or source is the Word of God. Not one of its prophecies has failed. That's a historical fact. Things spoken hundreds of years in advance that came to pass to the T, not one of its prophecies have failed. It's the only reliable source God's left us with, obviously, in the context of a relationship with him. The word that proceeds from his mouth. So, come on. It's a day for coming to Jesus. It's a day for drinking deep of Jesus. Come and drink. It's a day for believing and putting your trust again that he's able to carry us through the darkest of times. He can do this. It's a day to get back to the scripture. What has the scripture said? And then our primary text says, the person that does this, that follows this simple set of instructions, out of their heart, something will begin to flow. The Holy Spirit will begin flowing. Outreach from them will begin to flow out. This spake he of the Spirit. I'm listening to uh, an autobiography of Reese Howells. Reese Howells was uh, in, in England. He was uh, a young guy that was raised up. That he wrote a book called, Inter it was written of him, Intercessor, or one who prayed. And, and they say that his life and the ministry that God gave in, to him of concerning prayer changed the course of World War II. There's historical documents of, of, of them praying specific and strategic things that turned the course of the war. Many would say was the reason 
that the war ended when it did because if they hadn't been standing where they were the way they were, it could have lingered on and, and more and more people would have died. Powerful book, but as I've been listening to this book, he's, uh, you, you ask yourself, am I even a Christian? You know, this guy had such an amazing walk with God. It was like, oh my gosh, crazy stuff. And uh, in the midst of it, he talked about going from just being a believer to somebody that was surrendered and, and the result of that ultimate surrender, what we often we look to as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there was such a, a release of authority and power in the man's life. And as I was considering this stuff, I wanted to just say this today for this context. This is a day of fresh surrender to God. It really is. It's the day when the flowing waters of God out of your life, the usefulness of your life, not just what you need being met, but the overflow of your life will be the result of fresh surrender to the purpose and the plan of God. So for time's sake, you know, I'm comforted because even the writer of the book of Hebrews says, time would fail if I was to talk about, and then he lists a whole bunch of other people. So I'm okay. This is biblical. Time would fail if I was to go on and on and on. And y'all are going, yeah, we get it, Pastor. Come on, like bring it to a close, man. <clears throat> I'm trying to help you today and help me today. And I believe he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. If you keep reading, and I would encourage you to do so because I'm not giving you everything that's in here. I'm just giving you my gleanings. But I have to say that this portion of Scripture where Jesus stands up on the eighth day and everything Jesus says and all that occurs around that moment is a set of instructions for people who will be alive when we are alive at the eighth day. Uh, you say, well, you're stretching to get that. Maybe. But I'm telling you, everywhere I turn, the Lord keeps confirming it. Look into this portion of Scripture. So one of the things we find out, if you keep reading here, after Jesus makes this great declaration, people start talking. And people say, this has got to be the Christ. Others say, no, this can't be him. Does any Christ come out of Galilee? There's all this debate going on. And then it says this. Can we get this one verse up here? I think it's verse 43 or something. What is it? Uh, yeah, 743. I'm just kind of filling in the blanks here for time's sake. So there was a division among the people, and you should highlight this, over him. Let me say this. You need to get this because this is you're going to watch this happen. Right now in the world, the division, that there's a lot of division in the world today, a lot of unrest and disagreement and arguing. But at the end of the day, this isn't going to be about Democrat and Republican. It's not going to be about Jew and Muslim. It's going to be about Jesus. Now, you might not agree, and it's okay, but I'm just telling you, there was a division among the people over him. Everything will come down to what do you do with the person of Jesus Christ. Everything ultimately is going to come to this point. So that matters to us because if we're going to be awake and not asleep at the time of his coming, we want to be uh, able to communicate well the faith that we have within us and give a reason for the hope that lies within us because people are going to be divided. But the issue isn't political. It's about Jesus. And if we'll be wise if we move conversations to this primary issue, which is what are you doing with the person of Jesus Christ? If you roll the film forward down this portion of Scripture, I'm trying to get it out here. Verse 46 there were a bunch of people that said, why didn't you, the authorities say, why didn't you arrest him? This guy's out there turning everybody toward him. Why didn't you arrest him? And then this, this was their answer. I love it. Because no man ever spoke like this man. They, they say, we, 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 you know, how do you go arrest this guy? It's like you get around him, and, and as he's speaking, you can't touch it. What do you do with that? It's like he had so much authority, Jesus, when he was speaking. They said, why didn't you arrest him? You should have arrested him. He's creating trouble. No one ever spoke like him. No one ever spoke like him. Let me submit this to you. I believe something we can expect in day eight where we stand in a generation right now at the end of the age is preaching and teaching and communicating 
that has so much authority attached to it that no one can touch it. We're getting ready to stand on some of the greatest preaching, teaching, evangelistic outreaches, and you may be the voice God uses. Don't limit your capacity. Miracles, things are getting ready to happen. No, why didn't you? Because no one ever spoke like this man. Let me just tell you, the anointing, when it comes on your life, that, that grace from God will empower you. Did you know that some of the, the, um, the great awakening preachers could speak without microphones to tens of thousands of people and be heard? How? I'm telling you, Jesus, on this last day of the feast, stood up and cried. There's a grace coming to communicate like the earth has never known. You, th you think you got your favorite preachers or your favorite sermons. The earth has not heard the messages that are about to roll out among the nations. It has not. This is the hour for that. There's a grace coming to communicate with clarity and authority. And then I love this part. This, we're getting toward the end here, so uh, of the message, not of the world. Actually, toward the world, too. You read on, you scroll down. I'm just picking a few little things off of this portion of Scripture. But Nicodemus, the one that Jesus, you know, in John, what is it, John 3, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, who was a Jewish leader. And Jesus says to him, you know, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And he's like, what do you mean, born again? Does a man go back into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, no, 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 you're missing it. You're thinking about physical things. I'm talking about spiritual things. He says, are you not a leader in Israel and you don't know these things? Like, what's up? Come on. And so Jesus says, you've got to be born again. He says that to Nicodemus. Now, here you've got Nicodemus. When all the religious turmoil is cranking up on day eight here, and they're getting ready, they're trying to arrest him, and they're trying to figure out what to do with him. And Nicodemus says, excuse me. He's talking to his Jewish brothers. He says, does our law allow any man to be, uh, you know, incarcerated or, or, or locked up without having a fair trial? And then they say to Nicodemus, are you also one of his? And they start kind of pushing back on him. And let me just say this to you. Day eight is about a tremendous awakening among the Jewish people. There is a whole bunch of Jewish naturally born Jews that are getting ready to see Jesus as their Messiah and they're getting ready to come to faith, much like Nicodemus, who will stand up and defend the gospel among their peers. Yeah, that's happening. Expect it. We need to make a very clean distinction in our own heart where we're going to stand in this hour as it relates to Jesus, but also as it relates to his purpose and plan with natural Israel. I, rec I always recommend Romans chapter 11 for the person Who's in question? Who give me five more minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20. It's amazing how that, you know. I know I say this so many times, but it works every time. So why stop saying it? All right. Because you're old and wise, is that what you said? I heard that front row. You see, the problem with the front row is these little snide comments <laughs> that slip out. It's like, I'll talk to you later. All right. <laughs> How many days are in the Feast of Tabernacle? Eight. First seven days, they pour out water. On the eighth day, no water gets poured out. Jesus says, I am the water, basically. If any man's thirsty, come and drink. I'm it, right? That pattern, seven days and then an eighth day, is actually laid out in the book of Leviticus when it comes to the consecration of and ordination of the priesthood. Now, I realize for some of you this might be real new and kind of way out there, but for those of you that understand some of this, you'll get it and, and just hold on to it because it matters here. Leviticus, the ordination and the consecration of the priesthood because the Bible says in the New Testament that you who believe in Christ are a part of a new priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That means us, in some kind of mysterious way, serve like priests before God, which means we connect with God, and for people who don't know God, we stand in the gap between them and connect them to God. That's kind of our role as a priest, all right? But think of this eighth-day thing, because we're, all we're trying to do here is say, 
These are important eighth-day truths we should be aware of because I'm convinced we're living in such an environment. The eighth day. Look at this, Leviticus 8 and 33. Here's what it says. This is, and you shall go, um, you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed or consecration, some would say. For it will take Seven days to ordain you. So in the Old Testament, the priesthood went through a seven-day consecration and ordination process. Much like what happened with the Feast of Tabernacles, seven days, there were certain things that were occurring. And then the eighth day had something special attached to it, Leviticus chapter 9. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Okay? On the eighth day. Moses calls the priesthood to the forefront. Verse 9. Now remember, this is the day Israel was attacked on the eighth day of the feast. And I'm making this connection because I believe it's an hour that God once again is bringing forth a priesthood of believers in the earth. Leviticus 9 and 6. And Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Now this is on the eighth day. We've gone from seventh, the seven days of consecration. Now we're on the eighth day. And on this eighth day, Moses says to the priest, this is the thing the Lord has commanded you. Here's the reason for it, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Let me tell you, there's a revival coming to the church. Judgment begins with the church, the house of God. But there's a revival coming to the church that's supposed to spill out. You and I should be in full expectation of this. Leviticus 9, 23, I'm almost done. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Now check this out. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. This is speaking about such a tremendous restoration of God's church in the earth, no longer being the butt of jokes, but where the glory of God is flowing in such authority that people will fall on their faces. You know, in the days of the first church, People that were corruptly using things, even from within, in some cases, fell dead. Fell dead. Ananias and Sapphira would be one such case. And the fear of the Lord returned to the church. Things happened. You know, we're not talking about a low-voltage wire here. We're talking about the God of creation. And when he is allowed to draw near and to be present among people, Life is present, hope is present, peace is present, and what should be considered the fear of the Lord. And so if you're a good Bible student, you can look at Malachi chapter 3 and 4 in that area, because basically what's happening in that thing, God says, I'm going to purify the sons of Levi, that's the priesthood, and they're going to offer an offering to me in righteousness. Just like what happened here in Leviticus on the eighth day, there's going to be a pleasing something coming from God's people to him. Amen. Come on, jump up on your feet. We're going to pray. Worship team, if you don't mind coming back, I just want to make an opportunity this morning. I've given you a whole ton of stuff here today, and I don't want us to be lost in all of the detail. But I have to say to you that this is not an hour to be just floating around and not paying attention to things. Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, You can discern the sky and tell whether it's going to be a good day or a bad day, depending on the color of the sky. Jesus said this to some of the people there in his day. And he says, but you don't discern the times that you're living in. And sometimes we're, we're so good at certain things, but we've missed the indicators, the important stuff of what God is doing. And today I just want to create an opportunity for us to respond to the Lord. What does that mean? Well, if you're in a relationship with somebody and they ask you something, it's usually a good idea if you want the relationship to be meaningful to respond. Would you agree with that? Relationships, by very their nature, um, are two-way 
in nature. And I feel today like God has been speaking to us, some of you very specifically, some of you maybe in, in ways that are um, unique to your particular circumstance. But God's been speaking. I don't say that arrogantly. I just say it matter-of-factly. God's been speaking to us today. And I feel like it's only right for us to respond to what he's been saying. Maybe for some of you today, when I make mention of these words, this is an hour to come to Jesus. Maybe that is this day for you. Not to religion, not to a set of do's and don'ts, but to come to Jesus as a friend, a savior, and so on. Maybe that's you today, and I want to give you a chance to do that in a moment. I also want to give a chance. We're going to invite you to come forward here if you uh, are in a place in your heart where you're willing to count the cost. Anything meaningful costs something. Maybe you're here today and the honest truth would be in your heart of hearts that you've been a Christian, you know Jesus, but you haven't been drinking of him. You've been really busy and distracted maybe and you're just um, you're just not getting what you need. You're not being refreshed on a personal level. You feel very dry inside. And maybe today, your response to the Lord and what he's been saying is just to simply acknowledge, God, I've let other things get in the place that belong to you. And I just want to come back to the fountain and get a drink of who you are. Maybe that's you today. Maybe today, what's been speaking to you in this place is about your trust. Maybe you've been just eaten up with fears, stresses, and anxieties. As I said earlier, at the end of the day, that is an issue of our pride. You're not alone, by the way. Nobody's po poking at you as an individual as much as it's us together. But it is a pride issue where we think we can somehow manage all the moving parts and somehow keep ourselves safe and today it would be a great day to respond to the the conversation the lord wants to have by saying god <laughs> you're right i've been doing it all on my own and i just want to give it back to you i want to today i want to cast my cares i want to roll the cares in this crazy world where stress and fear are only growing i don't want to be someone caught by all that stuff I choose today to live in trust of who you are. I'm going to invite you just to come on forward. We've got some people that are going to pray here this morning. I'm going to be here myself, but uh, just so you kind of have an understanding of what we're about to do. We're going to just create a little space here for prayer. If that's you and you want to come step out in a way of acknowledging a certain need, we'll be here to pray with you. And maybe you just want to come you know, Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I too will deny you before my Father. It's like, don't be ashamed of Jesus today. If you are, then in the day you need him to stand by you, he's under no obligation, you know. And maybe today you just want to stand out and just say, God, before men, I, I acknowledge I'm in and I want everything you have. Whatever it is, we're going to invite you to come forward. If for some reason you need to slip out today, I'm going to ask you to do that respectfully. Just keep conversations to a minimal. If you're going to hang out and talk with somebody, please respect the atmosphere that's here because this is a holy space. And um, if you need to slip back and get your children, if you brought children with you and you want to come back in here, we're going to hang out here for a little bit. There won't be a formal dismissal. This is kind of it right here. But I don't want us to walk out of here having missed what God brought you here for today. If you do, you know, I just feel like you're going to suffer needlessly in the days to come. So let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I've done what you've asked me to do today. I've spoken the way I've felt inspired to speak. And I, I can't do anything beyond that other than to open now this place of conversation that people here and those even watching over the internet would have a chance to respond, relationally respond to you in a meaningful way. So God, we just open up our hearts and we open up this place and we open up all that happens here and what's about to happen in the world, God. We don't want to be those that are 
that are outside of your purpose and your plan. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us here today. And I ask you for this in Jesus' name.